Just love our literature, huh? <clears throat> so, we have a speaker tonight um, from Louisiana, and I am going to ask Michelle to come up here and introduce our speaker. I'm an addict named Michelle. Hey, y'all. It's great to be here. Um, I am so honored and humbled to be able to have the privilege to introduce y'all speaker tonight. Um, I met him early, early in recovery in Jackson, Mississippi, and I was drawn to him because he was wearing LSU. And, you know, I was from the coast. My family's from New Orleans. My uncle played ball at LSU. So, you know, it was that immediate connection of like, oh, hey, you know, a familiar kind of familiar thing for me. And then I found out that he had worked at the same family restaurant chain that I was now working at. So, you know, that just kind of compounded, you know, that, that friendship. But it grew to be more. Um, you know, I stayed, I got clean in Jackson and I stayed there for three years. And during that three year period, I was able to form an unbreakable friendship with him. He taught me that it is okay for a man and woman to be friends and nothing more. And he loved me unconditional. So I'm very honored and humbled to introduce Jerry S. to y'all tonight. My name is Jerry, and I'm an addict. Jerry! And uh, I, I want to uh, thank the, the people from Volunteer Regional for taking the time to call me over in Louisiana and ask if uh, I would come up and share my experience, strength, and hope with this committee or at this convention. For me, that's always a... Um, humbling experience when that call comes and they say, will you go and share your experience, strength, and hope with somebody else? Always in the hopes that, um, that you reach somebody. But the bottom line is that the people in this room tonight, any of us could have come up here and told the story because we all ended up in the same place doing pretty much the same thing. But the significance, of, at least what I've found, is that um, you come here, I came here in desperation. You know, last house on the block, nowhere else to go, finished, washed up. And there was somebody available to take my hand and said that if you want to try it this way, we think perhaps we can do what the rest of us have done. So I'm honored to do that. Um, I don't know. Um, I've been to VRC before a few times, different places, and it's always been a good time. I'll give you uh, just a little background information on myself and some of the stuff that got me here and some of the stuff that keeps me here. That's even more important. The um, my clean date, April 14, 1983, I got clean. So, it's an honor to say, I mean, tonight I stand up here at 38 years clean and I wonder what happened. How you get, you know, time, where to go and all that kind of stuff. But um, I didn't, I don't think when I was a kid, if you would have asked me if I would be talking at the VRC 
Some years later, I could have, you know, okayed that. But the situations that brought me here. Um, I grew up in New Orleans. Lived in New Orleans um, most of my life. Lived in, I live in Baton Rouge now because I was transferred there from work some years ago. But the, um, growing up, was pretty routine. Yeah, I was a Catholic, and like everybody else in New Orleans, I did Catholic stuff, like go to Catholic school and all that kind of stuff. You know. And when I was a, a kid, somewhere along the way, I guess from 13 to 18, I thought I had a calling from. God. I was a boy preacher. I used to go to tent revivals and preach all over southeastern United States. Everywhere. Just hellfire brimstone kind of preaching. And people were coming here. I didn't use during those years. When I was growing up, I didn't use at all. After graduating from high school, I think um, routine stuff. When I was a kid, you had to go take a physical for selective service. I took my physical up past, and they gave you a draft classification. And they classified me 1A, and I didn't think much about it. I went on about my business. But how significant that became later. I remember coming home from pickup basketball somewhere with some guys one day in the seven ward, and uh, my mom said that, uh, you remember you went to selective service a few weeks ago? Well, you got a letter from them today. And I opened the letter. Greetings from the President of the United States and your friends and neighbors have selected you to serve in the armed forces. And it stops you in your tracks because the Vietnam War was going on at the time. And I went through the neighborhood and asked my friends and neighbors, and <laughs> not a one of them knew anything about sending me a letter. So I said, this is not going to be good. I remember that. And so I got drafted. It was 1969, and um, I was drafted in March. I reported for duty at the end of March, and I think it was in mid-August I was shipping out to Vietnam. And I remember, um, I'll tell you something. If, um, if you can avoid going to war, do your best to do that. Because I'll tell you something, the night before I left, that's probably the most difficult night in the family thing. Because all the family gathered around the table having a dinner, mama cooking your favorite meal, and your brother's cracking jokes. And, and just near the end of dinner, everything gets quiet because the, the realization of where you're going, what's happening. And... Uh, we are not a family who looked at each other all the time and said, I love you or I want you to, to take care. But that night, everybody managed to get out something to say, you know, be careful, try to come back. It was the height of the war. It was, it was an insane time, and, and not just in Vietnam, but in the country. And I um, said my goodbyes, and I flew out. And uh, we landed in uh, Cameron Bay, Vietnam, some few days later. And I didn't know that night when I landed that my life was to change as much as it did. The significance of war is that when you're there, you know, you can be for or against the war. But when you're the guy on the ground and they're shooting at you and you're the guy ducking the bullets, 
your primary focus is try to get out of there alive. And that's what I had to do. I remember I was, um, my job, I'd been trained in the Army to be a machine gunner. I, carried, I worked in a infantry small arms rifle machine gun unit. And then now that's what I did. I would get on helicopters, they would fly us out in the bush and we'd stay out 21, 30 days chasing Charlie. And sometimes some of us made it back, some didn't. But the thing is, the night, the first night I was in country, they rocket my base. Just rockets coming from everywhere out the sky, blowing, attacking the base. And I was scared. My first time in country on the fire. And a guy was in the bunker. We were in bunkers that night trying to wait until they gave us the all clear that they'd knocked the rockets out. And a guy in the bunker said, man, you're scared. I got something to help you. First time I ever used. Man. You know, I've been a preacher. I've been this and that, but I'd never used. And he said, uh, he gave me something. He said, this will help you get through Nam. And he was, he was an old-timer from Vietnam. He had been there over 90 days. He had managed to stay alive that long. And I remember um, when he gave it to me, it gives you a signal that this stuff is not good for you. You, know? you sweat, you throw up, you get sick, you get chills. And when they lifted and gave the all clear that the rockets were out, they knocked them out. The aircraft had knocked them out. I went and found that guy and said, you got any more of that stuff that make you sick and make your eyes water and make you go crazy? He said, yeah, plenty of it here. And then that was the first night. Now, I'm going to fast forward a little bit in Vietnam. I stayed over there a while. You're required to do one year. At the end of the year, they told me, my sergeant said to me, your time's up. You can rotate back stateside, d roast they called it. This is the first signal. I told him I don't want to go home. Give me another tour. Now, I'm in a combat infantry unit. They're killing people right and left all around me every day, medevacs and booby traps and aircraft all over the place dropping bombs. But I found a friend in Vietnam, and I had fallen deeply, deeply in love with that friend. And I would risk my life daily for the next 15 years to do anything I had to to be close to him. And if it meant another tour in country, I'd say another tour, you know, cut and dry. So Saad said, okay, you stay. But God, as I understand today, intervenes in craziness sometimes. Second tour, I'd been in country another four months or something. Routine for me, get on a helicopter, fly out to the bush, shoot up whatever they find and come back. Second tour. We go out February 71, 70. They hit the bird we're on. They come down. We crash. We all shot up. Everybody. People on the ground everywhere. That's the last thing I remembered about being in country Vietnam because I passed out from a loss of blood somewhere and a medic, an army medic, crawled on his hands and knees and found us. Passed us up and called some medevac helicopters to bring us to a hospital. And when I woke up again, I'd been to surgery and I was all hooked up on the IV. And I was aboard a C-130 cargo from the Air Force, U.S. Air Force. 
And during wartime, they take all the seats out of Air Force cargo planes and they put litters to stack wounded and dead on. And when I woke up, I didn't know where I was. The anesthesia wore off, and I remember I was screaming for my gun because I was a machine gun. Where's my gun? The last thing I remember, we were going down, and I needed my gun because we were going to need it on the ground. And the nurse comes over, the flight nurse says, you're boarding the aircraft, you're going to your coat in Japan, you don't need a gun. The war is over for you. I said, man, you don't, you don't understand. The war can't end for me. We got to go back. So you can't go back. That's all. It's done with. And that's how I got started. That was my beginning of my drug use. Now I'm going to fast forward away from that to uh, let you know that obviously I made it through that because they brought me into Yokota, Japan, and from Yokota, they brought me a, few, a month or so later into uh, Walter Reed Hospital, and we recovered in there. And when, this is the amazing thing about when I got to Walter Reed, they told me that while I was in Vietnam, they developed a cure for addiction. They said, yeah. I said, man, I certainly need that. I hope you got it. And they gave it to me. And they called it methadone. They said, this is your cure. I'm going to give you this. Put you on it. it maintain you for life. Don't worry about it. But they didn't tell the whole story. You see? They didn't tell me that this cure they found was going to make me worse than I was that I was going to, for the next six years, every morning at 5.30, slip up to the window and ask the nurse, the nurse, my number's 917, give me my dose. For six years, every day, on Tulane and Rendon Street in New Orleans. She gave it to me. They didn't tell me that they didn't intend at that time that that methadone was the cure. They did not intend that I ever get off the drug. It was, a, it was supposed to be a lifetime maintenance drug. Six years on it, I went into the clinic one day and I said, I want a detox. I don't want any more. Got enough. She said, okay. He sent me to Gulfport, Mississippi to a VA center and they started the detoxification process, methadone. I guess it took a month or two, whatever, they kept me in the hospital and go for it. And they detoxed me. You can detox me off the methadone, but you didn't detox me off the lifestyle that goes with it. So I kept doing all the crazy stuff I was doing. I used to do my methadone in the morning, go down and run around New Orleans all day, carrying on, get some kind of dope to put me to sleep that night. At the end of my period in Gulfport, at the end of the time that they detoxed me, I was a um, Vietnam vet. So they said Vietnam vets have special privileges with the uh, Civil Service Board. We're going to get you a job. I said, the only thing I'm trained to do in line of work, I can preach, which I don't want to preach anymore. And I'm a machine gun. Do you need either one? <laughs> she said, no. I don't need a preacher. I'm not looking for a machine gun. Then they said, I'll tell you what you do. You take the civil service test and see where you place. And I did. I took the test to be employed by the civil service, federal, state, local, all of them, general tests. Nobody called me. A month or so passed, nobody called me. I took the test. One day I got a call and said, hey, we're calling you because you scored well on the civil service test. We want you to come down and interview and see if we can hire you. 
Okay. It was the um, it was in Gulfport, Mississippi. Harrison County Sheriff's Department called me. He said, "We want you to apply for a deputy sheriff." I said, mm -hmm. "That's that's something. Yeah, I'll be down there." And I went. I knew how to, the uh, mil the police departments work like paramilitary units. I knew how to go down there and do that and make rank and get the job. So they hired me. I finished the academy and they hired me. So I was in the middle of kicking methadone in the middle of a drug addiction and they hired me as a deputy sheriff in Harrison County, Mississippi. I said, man, it don't get much better than this. I remember those days. I said, what's my job? They gave me an assignment. They said, your first assignment you will be the officer in charge of the evidence room. That was my job. So you make sure all the evidence is secure and gets to court. And I said, okay. Fine with me. And needless to say, they moved me from evidence to something else after a short while. A lot of the evidence didn't make it to court, so... They said, we're going to put you in something else. And this is where the craziness comes in, okay? The people who hired me knew something was wrong, and they could have fired me when they got me out of evidence, but they didn't. They put me in the county jail and said, you're going to be the assistant warden in the county jail. Okay. I didn't argue with that. Before I left that county, sometime later, a year or so later, my jail, my jail on the system warden was on rock and roll. You name it, we got it for you. <laughs> you came without dope, you see the warden, he'll take care of you. We went through that process for a long time over there. You, what you need, your girlfriend? Uh, you can bring your girlfriend to visit next week. All, all kinds, anything could be bought. It was a crazy place to be at the time, early 80s in uh, Mississippi. And I worked there until one day I came into work at my jail. My boss, who was the county sheriff, was locked up in my jail. That was his jail. He's the sheriff of the county. And they locked him up. Sting operation. FBI locked him up. Put him in jail. And he said one thing to me that morning. He bailed out, but before he bailed out, he told me, he says, if I were you, and we were in all kind of crazy stuff in the jail, if I were you, I would leave town. I said, I'm gone. And we left. I left. You know, he went on to do time and all that later, but I left the jail. And this is... Um, Hmm, 82. I remember leaving, and by that, uh, I was doing good on the coast of Mississippi. I had everything I wanted. I had housing, apartments, women, money, jewelry, Cadillacs. I, you could sell anything, and everybody was buying everything. It was Everything was okay, because the right people were shared. I remember that. But I'd lost everything, too. Uh, the thing I learned about the dope game, you're not on top for long. Because every day you're up here, somebody's coming to get you. Whether it be the police, whether it be the dealer down the street, or whoever you got, you got to always do that and look over your shoulder. And I remember that. I lost a lot of stuff, and I left, I left Gulfport hitchhiking one morning. Around April, 83. And a truck driver picked me up and he brought me to Hattiesburg, Mississippi, or Law, Mississippi, right, on Interstate 59. He said, as far as I'm going to take you, and I got out the truck and I hitchhiked the rest of the day and nobody picked me up. And it was starting to get dark in the evening. It was starting to get dark there. 
I got in the ditch on the side of the interstate, and I said, I'm going to spend the night in this ditch, and uh, I'll, I'll try it in the morning. Get spiritual awakening, higher powers. I'm lying in the ditch. I'm not hitchhiking anymore. It's starting to rain. It's cold. It's April 1983, April 13th, to be precise. I'm in the ditch, and I'd say, I don't think I'd prayed since I'd been on a helicopter in Vietnam. That was 15 years before that. I said, God, look, I'll tell you what. Oh, help me out or take me out. I don't want to get out the ditch. No more hustle. No more game. It's over for me. I prayed that prayer, and 10 minutes later, 10 minutes later, somebody stopped. I got a little red pickup truck. I'm lying in the ditch. I'm not hitchhiking. And he said, get in the truck. I'm supposed to take you where you're supposed to go. That's what he told me. I'd never seen the man before. I have not seen him since that day. And he put me in the truck, and he brought me to East Mississippi State Hospital in Gulfport, in uh, Meridian, rather. And he said, get out the truck, ring the doorbell, and there'll be somebody waiting for you. I got out the truck, I rang the doorbell, and I looked back, the truck is gone, he's gone. And the nurse said, come on in. And that's when the journey changed for me. She said, tonight at 7.30, they're going to bring a meeting in, and they're going to call it Narcotics Anonymous. It's a voluntary meeting. And she said, I suggest you voluntarily go in there. <laughs> That's what she told me. And I did. I, I went into the meeting. That was my first meeting. It was at, at East Mississippi State Hospital in uh, Meridian, Mississippi. And the nurse told me, you're in the right place. She said, because it's such as abuse treatment over here. And it's psychotic treatment over here. You qualify for both. No, it's a, so I'm over there with the substance abuse that night. The meeting came in, and there was a guy in that meeting. Every time he spoke, he told my story. I was saying, look, man, I've been to Nam. I've been on the methadone clinic. I sleep in abandoned houses on the back of town in New Orleans. I, I, no way. I, I can't get this thing. You can't help somebody like me, bro. I mean, you know, I'm in and out of Central Lock. Every, he says, I've been all those places. I've been in Nam. I've been on the methadone. But the significant part he said that night that they had never told me anywhere else I'd been, he said, hey, man, I got 10 years clean. I said, what? I heard that. He said, all those places and all those things you talked about, and he was clean. And he said, if you stick with us, we can show you how to get clean. I've been to probably 25 treatment centers before that. Detox centers, treatment centers, detox a while, go back out, detox, go back out. All through the VA system. Detox, go back out. I used to lead a detox at the VA on Perdido Street and be running to Rampart and Nevada Street. Wide open, double time. He said, I can break the habit if you stay with us. And it was that night he told me, when you go to bed tonight, take your shoes off and throw them underneath the bed as far as you can. And while you're down there throwing your shoes, say, please, God, help me stay clean tonight. Simple prayer. He said, tomorrow morning when you get up, your shoes are already under the bed. You got to get back down there. He's a smart guy. It didn't take much to outsmart me. He said, <laughs> and I said, okay. The next morning you pray while you're down there, God, please don't let me use today. And that's how the process started for me. Uh, I, I had had two jobs in my life when I got to that treatment center. I'd been a, a preacher and a machine gunner. 
So when I'd been at that treatment center five or six weeks, they said, you got to leave here and you got to get a job. And I gave them my resume and they said, we don't need a preacher. We don't need a machine gun. So they got me a job. That's what Michelle was talking about, working for a family agency. At that time, the Piccadilly chain that's out was called Morrison's Cafeterias, you know, back then. That changed throughout the South. And they gave me a job. I was a dishwasher. I used to stand at the end of the dish machine and catch the dishes when they come off, and I'd stack them on a rack and roll them wherever they had to go in the cafeteria. And I did that over and over. And I stayed clean. And I went to meetings every day. I had a sponsor. He took me to meetings every day. I didn't have any money to put in the basket. He taught me about service. He said, you don't have any money to put in the basket. I got the key to the meeting hall. When the meeting is over, I'm going to lock you in the meeting hall. You sweep the floor, and that'll be your contribution. Simple things. And that kept me going. Now, a couple of things where I was working there in Gulf Ford that was significant to me. When I was a deputy, part of my job was to transport prisoners from county jail to state prison. Simple job. You put a guy in his handcuffs, he's in the back of the unit to take them to prison. We get to Hattiesburg. The guy says, I want to use the phone, the guy that's the prison. Me and my partner said, we want to get high. Right? So we make a deal. We said, we're going to handcuff you to the telephone booth. Back then they had phone booth. <laughs> handcuff you to the phone booth, and we're going to go around the corner and get high. We come back and get you. He said, okay, it's unfair. So we handcuffed him to the phone booth. Hands up. We went around the corner and got high. 200 miles later, we remembered him. <laughs> we were at the prison. We pulled up at the gate at Park from prison. They said, where's your prisoner? Shit. <laughs> we left him. We left him. By the grace of God, the sheriff from that county saw him and got fit over there and asked him, how the hell did this happen? He said, two officers left me. He wasn't in a hurry. He was going to do life at the state prison. He wasn't in a rush to get up there. So he didn't object. They had him. When I got back to the office, the sheriff, I told my boss, the sheriff, and I said, uh, I know you got to fire me. and We're friends and all that stuff, but you can't. I know you can't put up with that. And uh, this is how addiction works. He looked at me and he said, oh, shit, man. Shit happens. <laughs> Let's smoke a joint. I said, okay. That's the kind of stuff I got into. All right? Now, fast forward. What the program can do for you. From the night they introduced me in 1983 in Meridian, up until now, I haven't had to go back. There's no relapse in the story. I've been able to, by the grace of God and the fellowship of our cause and Anonymous, keep that 38 years intact. That's significant to tell you that you can do it. The other side of that coin is when the guy that's struggling and he has to come five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times before he get it. My job is to keep the door open and make sure the meeting's available. I don't, I don't punish and I don't, I don't judge. I try to love you back to wherever you need to be and try to meet you where you're at and that kind of stuff. Um, responsibility. The newcomer comes in the room like I was. I'll tell you what. When I first cleaned up, about the first, after three, four months clean, see, I'd been using drugs that kill your sex drive. You had no, no interest in sex whatsoever. None. Okay. 
I got clean after three months. Everything went to working again. Oh, shit. Here we go. We're going to have some fun tonight. <laughs> That's what happened for me. Say, who is it? I don't care who, he, she, what, the family, dog. We got to have some fun. And we went insane with that. I went off the deep end on that thing. You know, sponsor had to call me aside and said, we need to go back to step one. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll start working steps on that. Present with the problem, the solution is somewhere between 1 and 12. Every problem I've, I've encountered in here, there was a solution somewhere between 1 and 12 that applied to my life, that I could work this problem out. And the sex thing, and let me tell you something, if you're in here and you're a predator and you're looking for sex or you're looking for newcomers or you're looking to do the opposite of what we're telling you to do, it's going to catch you. You're going to have to pay for that one day down the road. I know that. I've watched that over and over and over. Uh, I remember going to meetings. I called my sponsor. I had five years clean. I said, sponsor, I'm tired of being clean. I'm going to give me some dope. And my sponsor was smarter than me, a lot smarter than me. He said, uh, when you going? I said, oh, no. An hour or so from now. He said, I'll tell you what. Sit there on the porch until I get there. I'm going to go with you. 30 years later, I'm still sitting on the porch. He ain't come. <laughs> he didn't show up. That's what it takes. Uh, we're simple people. We try to take it and make that we're this and that. It's very simple. The, food, the police called me to the car one night. I'm standing on the Rado and Rampart Street. He said, Jerry, come out here to the car. It's raining, right? Raining everywhere. Six district police. He says, I'm not going to get out the car and chase you tonight. Like he usually does. He said, I'm not. I'm not. He said, because tomorrow night when I come on duty at 7 o'clock, you're going to be on the same corner and I'm going to put you in jail. I said, oh, I won't be there. I can beat that. Next night at 7 o'clock, you put your hands on the car. <laughs> he put my hands on me, pat me down, run me in such a lockup. Because he understood something I didn't at the time. I had to be on that corner. My whole world was on that corner. There was nothing legal on that corner. Everything on that, the only reason you went to that corner is because you wanted to go to jail or to get killed or something illegal had to go down. There's no other reason to have that corner. That's why I tell you that the, the thought of death or the threat of death would not stop an addict from using I'm standing there watching the coroner's wagon roll up and down Rampart Street, putting people in the back of the wagon dead. And I go stand on that same spot. I wonder where he copped that. See? I'm caught in the grip. Now, I don't know any other way. And when that guy stopped in that little truck that they on the side of the interstate, and he said, hey, man, we'll take you where you're supposed to go. Power greater than me. He sent him. And the ladies, the nurses waiting at the door when I arrived said, come on in, man. Come on. We're waiting. Yeah. And uh, I was so hip, sick, and cool, I thought nobody in the family or in the game knew what I was doing. Everybody. The only person I fooled the whole time I was in the game was me. Everybody else was hip to everything I did, long before I did it. My family would have a family reunion on Saturday. They'd tell me about it on Monday. They said, we had a family reunion Saturday. I said, well, you didn't tell me. I'm part of the family. They said, no, you're not anymore. Because every time you come, the person's, somebody missing stuff out of the person's wallets disappear. Nice jewelry don't show up anymore. So I couldn't go home. Mama put a restraining order on me. I couldn't come in the house. That can change. As low as you may have gone, there's a way up. I was sitting, I'd been clean 
uh, 13 years or so, I think, um, at work. I was working for the VA by now. I'm working at a VA center in uh, Baton Rouge. I'm the security man at the VA. UPS pulls up and says, we got a letter for y'all. I said, okay, that part of my job is to sign for the mail. He said, you're Jerry Smith. I said, Jerry S. to y'all, but I'm Jerry Smith. I said, okay. He says, um, the letter's for you. Open it. I'm surprised. I don't get mail at work. He says, open it. And it scared me to death when I first opened it. The first words I saw was greetings. I said, no, you got the wrong dude. Nobody, I've been, I'm not going, no, hell no. <laughs> Greetings, that's what it said. Same thing that draft notice said, from the president. That's what it said, now from the president, listen to me. Of the United States, I told you I'm going. I'm looking for a way out the clinic, now I'm getting ready to run. It says from the United States Olympic Committee, 1996, the games were in Atlanta. Somebody sent them my story. They selected me to carry the flame in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> There's no limit here on where you can go and what you can do, where you came from and where you can go, you know. But it requires some effort and some work on my part. It requires those relentless nights when you're going to stay up and right on the step when you'd rather be watching the Monday night football game. At that time, you're on the phone and that newcomer just can't get it. It's 2 30 in the morning and you need to sleep. But you got to listen to him one more time. That time when he calls you and he says, look, uh, I know I called you last week and the week before and the week before that, but tonight I'm really ready. Can you take me to detox? And you grab a button and y'all go. It requires that kind of stuff. That kind of you make a commitment here. I am not gonna go back to using, and these are the things I have to do to stay away from them. The more of these things I do, the less the less chance I have of going back. You know? I don't go on dope houses and get people. Because for me, his dope in there is more powerful than my recovery. If I go in there and watch it and look at it and sit down with it, I'm in trouble. A friend of mine, the guy that sponsored me, had 18 years clean. And, you know, he's a, he was like the rest of the guys in the program. He's a player. That's what he called himself. I'm a player. He said, okay, okay player. A lady at a dope house called him. Crack house, she's smoking crack. She says, uh, come pick me up, I'm ready, I'm ready to quit. I'm wrapping it, I'm through, I had enough. She said, pick me up, bring me a detox, bring me a treatment, let me stay at your house, whatever. He picks her up at the dope house. She get in the truck. They turn the corner from Carondelet and go up uh, Mount Me to St. Charles. Make a right on St. Charles and the blue lights come on, right? Police pull the truck over. That's a task force out there. They pull the truck over. She takes a crack pipe out of her pocket and drops it on the floor. This 18-year guy. I got 18 years clean. All right. Police say, uh, what you doing in this neighborhood? All that kind of stuff. He said, can I search the truck? The guy said, man, I've been clean 18 years. Search the truck. He didn't know she had dropped a hot pipe. What made the police notice the pipe when he touched it, it burned his hand? He had 18 years clean. She didn't cop that it was her pipe. He, my 18 year sponsee, went to jail that night and was charged with a felony. And eventually they worked it out and copped down to a misdemeanor or whatever and let it go. But you don't have to go through all that. That's avoidable. What I've learned in here, if something is, if you can predict something, you more than likely can prevent that same incident. 
from reoccurring. If you can, I can predict that if I go set up in the dope house and watch you do dope, that I'm going to do some. So the best thing for me is not to go. No, it's not that complicated of an equation. You know? I don't know. Um, yeah, you go from living like I live to carrying the torch. I'm sitting there, I got the torch. That, you know, you run and bring the torch, it gets it to you at your station, and you run it on. And the guy standing over here was the vice president of the United States. At that time, it was uh, Gore. He was Clinton vice president. I said, Mr. President, I ought to tell you some shit and make you run, but I won't bother you. <laughs> I won't bother you because, you, you know, you're rich, easy going, fella. I'm not going to bother you. And I did nothing. That's a great honor. I'll tell you that because, that was, you know, I can't imagine that happening to me. Um, I'm getting ready to wrap it up. There's no, um, there's no limits in here. All right? You deserve that seat. You deserve to do better. You don't ever, ever, ever have to go back. Now, some of us may, and no one is excluded from that. I don't care how long you've been here. We all must do our daily daily thing or the reprieve can be snatched away. But you don't ever have to go back if you're willing to do the necessary stuff. One through 12 is an answer to all of my troubles today. I can't pick and choose which part of the program I'm going to work in my life. I must work these things in all my affairs. I can't say I'm going to work it at, at uh, the meeting. We can talk to talk. I can get up here and talk all night, talk good shit, and leave here and use. You got, it's an inside-out job. And it requires me to fix the inside. You'll always see the changes on the outside. You'll gain a little weight, or you'll get lose a little weight, or you'll get a little jewelry. We can see that. That's physical shit. You can see. I got a lot of show off shit on the night. You can see that. You know. That's not the answer. When I put my head tonight down on the pillow, is there anybody I wronged today I need to go to? Did I intentionally hurt somebody? Did I unintentionally hurt somebody and now I'm aware of it and I need to go there? The principles, the change in your life. What was acceptable when I walked in this door is no longer acceptable. It was acceptable when I came in here that I could sleep with your wife, I would. I can't sleep with anybody now, so don't worry about it. So just, <laughs> all, all that time has passed. But <laughs> I'm just talking about. And another thing I wanted to share with y'all yesterday, Thanksgiving Day, yesterday. I like to be thankful for, like all of us do. I made 70 years old yesterday. That was my birthday. You see? <laughs> man, man. Uh, I never thought that I was sitting in the door of that helicopter in Nam and they were shooting us up every day that I'd get to see 70. I was an 18-year-old kid, you know, jumping out, paratrooper and all that shit. Invincible. This program can humble you. And sometime before we reach a humble state, we have to be humiliated because we're hard hit. We don't listen. I told you don't do it that way. That it didn't work for 99 of us. Oh, but I'll be the exception. A disease that never goes to sleep. It's constantly out there planning how it can get you. What made the gorilla in Vietnam so effective? He didn't have any weapons. We had jets and planes and ships. He didn't have nothing. He had punchy sticks and, and sandals. But he was never off guard. He waited until our weakest moments and he would hit us with all he had. And he knew one day he'd wear us down. He did. Thank you to the committee who took the time to call over to Louisiana and ask me, ask me if I would come over here. Uh, it's always an honor. It's always a pleasure, especially to see people over there I haven't seen for a while and Somebody, we were doing the old time or something up here today. Somebody brought me a question. How many licks it take to get to a popsicle? 
Send her a popsicle. What the hell? I don't know. I can't eat popsicles no more. I don't know. <laughs> y'all remember that. Some of y'all were on that panel when they brought that question in. I don't know where the question came from, but okay, it kept me alive for another day. That's all I think. Thank you, Jerry. Well, let me see. I don't think I have any more announcements that I... <laughs> oh, well, no. We're just Well, then, just for you, Lewis. We're going to have the merchandise room will be open over here. There's a silent auction. If you want to get yourself an inexpensive T-shirt... Go ahead and put uh, a bid out over there. We're going to be shutting those bids down at 4.30 tomorrow afternoon. Um, make sure that you um, 